My name is Luis Lopez. I am chief of the policy and strategy section in the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. I have the privilege of emceeing today's event. On behalf of the Department Civil Rights Division, let me welcome you to our virtual forum entitled Uniting Against Hate, Connecting Community Voices and Strengthening Law Enforcement Partnerships. We are thrilled to be joined today by so many of our partners and friends across the government and in communities around the country. At the outset, I want to thank Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, for spearheading today's forum and for her continuing to shine a bright light on the department's efforts to combat hate crimes and hate incidents. Today, we will focus attention on the robust efforts taking place to build and deepen trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. As such, we will highlight compelling stories from the department's United Against Hate Community Outreach and Engagement Program. Today, we have three panels to discuss the devastating impact of hate crimes and hate incidents, as well as the challenges in preventing and prosecuting these actions. In the first panel, you will hear, you will hear from four U.S. attorneys who have been leaders in the United Against Hate program. These leaders will discuss the importance of community and law enforcement partnerships in preventing and prosecuting hate crimes. In the second panel, we will hear from advocates and survivors of hate crimes who will help us understand how we can support victims and how to prevent future acts of hate. After a brief summary of the grant making activity in this space, we will conclude with a third panel of community leaders from a variety of national civil rights organizations. Drawing on their perspectives, we will outline strategies for moving forward together. We hope that these conversations inspire community members and advocates to continue to seek out partnerships with their local U.S. Attorney's offices to further strengthen and amplify this critical discourse in our country. Before we begin, however, let me briefly go over a few housekeeping items. First, we will be using the Zoom platform's chat function as a mechanism for making important announcements to participants. Please be sure to check for messages during today's event. Second, the audio and video functions for participants will remain off for the duration of the program from now until 3 p.m. Eastern time. Lastly, this event is being recorded. You received a Privacy Act notice from us concerning the collection of information during the program. And with that, we are ready to begin. To get us started, I'd like to introduce the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick B. Garland, to deliver the opening remarks for this program. Good afternoon, and welcome to this virtual forum on the Justice Department's United Against Hate Initiative. I wanna thank Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark for bringing us together and for her extraordinary leadership of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. I also wanna recognize Officer Jamie Bird Grant and Dennis and Judy Shepard who are joining us today. The law named in memory of their loved ones has given the Justice Department critical tools with which to prosecute and deter acts of hate. We are grateful for your presence and your continued advocacy in honor of James and Matthew. Over the past year, every one of the Justice Department's 94 United States Attorney's Offices has brought together community groups, community leaders, and law enforcement at every level to build trust and strengthen coordination to combat unlawful acts of hate. We launched that nationwide program, United Against Hate, because we know that combating hate crimes requires a coordinated, united effort. We also know that the time to build relationships and trust between law enforcement and community partners is before an incident or crisis occurs. Although our work to combat hate crimes is always important, it can quickly become more urgent at any time. It is in those moments when we rely on our partnerships the most. That is exactly what we have seen over the past several weeks. As I see in my daily threat briefings, there has been a significant increase in the volume and frequency of threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab communities across our country. Yesterday, 
We arrested and charged a person with pose, posting threats to kill or injure Jews at Cornell University. As this arrest shows, we are focusing our efforts on confronting and disrupting illegal threats wherever they arise. The Justice Department has no tolerance for violence or unlawful threats of violence fueled by anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. I recognize the fear, frustration, and isolation that many of you have felt over the past few weeks and that you continue to feel as you join us here today. I want to reiterate a core principle of this Justice Department. No person and no community in this country should have to live in fear of hate-fueled violence. You are not alone, and the Justice Department is committed to building on our partnerships with all of you to combat illegal acts of hate. That is why I have directed all of our U.S. attorneys and FBI field offices to work closely with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners in their districts to keep their communities safe. That is why I have directed our U.S. attorneys to reach out to religious and other community leaders in their districts to reaffirm our commitment to them and assess what additional support they may need. And that is why we are meeting today. The Justice Department was founded 153 years ago with the principal task of securing the civil rights promised by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. This meant protecting Black Americans seeking to exercise their right to vote from terrible violence and threats of violence by white supremacists. Today, combating hate-fueled violence remains central to the Justice Department's mission. The name of this initiative and the theme of our meetings today, United Against Hate, is no accident. For our democracy to function, we must all be protected in our right to live free from hate-fueled violence and the threat of violence. We must all be protected in our right to hold different opinions and to voice those opinions peacefully. And we must all be united against hate. As you begin today's important conversations, please know that this Justice Department is committed to protecting you now and always. That was the department's founding purpose, and it is a purpose that I am proud to embrace as Attorney General. Thank you for being here. Welcome back. And to those just joining us, hello for the first time. All participants should have received a program guide that details today's agenda and provides the names and biographies of all of our speakers. That document also provides helpful resources to combat hate crimes and hate incidents. We'll drop that guide again into the Zoom chat now. Now I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Attorney General Clark to share opening remarks and then have a fireside chat with a very special guest. Thank you, uh, Lewis, and thank you, Attorney General Garland, for joining us for this important program today. As we are all tragically and painfully aware, the threat from hate-fueled violence remains as serious as ever. A few weeks ago, the FBI released its latest hate crime statistics for 2022. They show that hate crimes remain at the highest levels in more than a decade. As in previous years, the re recently released data shows that almost 60% of hate crimes targeted victims based on their race, ethnicity, or ancestry, with Black people being among those most frequently targeted. The data also shows that anti-Semitic hate crimes rose 25% from last year, with those crimes accounting for over half of all reported religious-based hate crimes. Hate crimes against Muslim Americans or those perceived to be Muslim constituted a significant portion of the remainder of the religious-based hate crimes. Hate crimes targeting sexual orientation or gender identity also rose 16% last year. But we also know that the, st the statistics only tell part of the story as underreporting remains a challenge. 
some state and local law enforcement agencies still do not report data to the FBI. And there are victims who are reluctant to report hate crimes or hate incidents to local law enforcement. We know that complete and accurate data is critical to our ability to prevent and prosecute hate crimes when they occur. But the sad reality remains that far too many people in this country remain vulnerable to bias motivated violence simply because of who they are, what they look like, where they worship, where they come from, or who they love. The Justice Department is working tirelessly to investigate and combat these unlawful acts of hate. From his first days in office, Attorney General Garland has made clear that one of the department's top priorities is the prosecution and prevention of hate crimes. And at the Civil Rights Division, we take that charge seriously. Since January of 2021, the Civil Rights Division has charged more than 80 defendants and more than 100 cases for committing hate crimes. And during that time, we've obtained, obtained more than 85 convictions. This is work we carry out in close partnership with U.S. Attorney's offices, with the FBI, and with the support of local and state law enforcement. Our prosecutions sadly make clear that hate crimes are not from a bygone era, but a crisis that continues to tear at the fabric of our nation. Earlier this year, we obtained a guilty verdict against the perpetrator who killed 11 people and critically wounded seven others at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018. We're honored to have Rabbi Hazan Jeffrey Myers from the Tree of Life with us today to reflect on how the community has come through that tragedy. This year, we also secured the conviction of the man who killed 23 people and wounded 22 more at the Cielo Vista Walmart in El Paso, Texas for no reason other than their Hispanic identity and national origin. The killer was recently sentenced to 90 consecutive life terms. But to provide you a sense of the breadth and scope of what hate-fueled violence looks like in our country, I wanna highlight some of our cases over the month of October alone. In Illinois, we're investigating as a potential hate crime, the horrific and fatal stabbing of six-year-old Wadia Al-Fayyum and serious injuries suffered by his mother, Hanan Shaheen in Illinois. In South Carolina, a man pleaded guilty to obstructing justice in the murder of a black transgender woman, Dime Doe. In Ohio, a man pleaded guilty to federal charges after throwing two Molotov cocktails at a church, hoping to burn it to the ground because of their plans to host drag show events and the church's support for the LGBTQI plus community. In Florida, a man was sentenced for his racially motivated attack and attempt to use his pickup truck to strike a group of black men who were surveying land near the location of the 1923 Rosewood Massacre site. In Indiana, a man was indicted for allegedly leaving voicemails threatening to kill Jewish people at Anti-Defamation League offices in New York, Texas, Colorado, and Nevada. This is what just one month of our work to combat hate across America looks like today. We will discuss a number of these cases. Our prosecutions of hate crimes are vital. Hate crimes are message crimes. Through their violence, the perpetrators of these crimes not only target victims, but also seek to instill fear in the communities they target. But our prosecutions are intended to send a louder and more powerful message that hate crimes will not be tolerated in our democracy today. Perpetrators of hate crimes will be punished and held fully accountable that the communities targeted by these crimes are valued and will be safeguarded by the federal government. But we know that prosecutions alone are not enough to eliminate the crisis of hate root and branch. Prevention and public education are key. Trust between communities, law enforcement is also necessary and that's 
why we're here today. In September of 2022, at the United We Stand Summit at the White House, Attorney General Garland directed all 94 U.S. Attorney's offices to host United Against Hate programs across the country. As the Attorney General noted, this innovative community outreach and engagement program brings law enforcement and communities together to discuss the reporting, impact, and prevention of hate crimes and hate incidents. Through United Against Hate, we have strengthened community resilience to combat hate and position the Justice Department to better identify, prosecute, and most importantly, prevent unlawful acts of hate. Today, I'm pleased to announce that we're releasing a resource that discusses the United Against Hate efforts and highlights how our U.S. Attorney's offices are continuing to work in their local communities to address hate crimes and hate incidents. I'm proud that all 94 U.S. Attorney's offices have activated, hosting more than 200 United Against Hate events that have brought together more than 6,000 community members, uh, faith leaders, and law enforcement officers under one umbrella. Make no mistake, hate-fueled violence is a stain on our nation's history, but today's program centers the experiences and tragedies of survivors and communities. The Charleston Nine, the El Paso 23, the Tree of Life 11, the Buffalo 10, the Club Q5, the Jacksonville 3. We remain steadfast in honoring their lives by vigorously defending civil rights laws in every way we can. We champion transcendental ideals of freedom and equality to dispel the discord of hatred and prejudice. Being here today gives us space to honor the memories of those who lost their lives and space to affirm that their lives mattered. Two lives that most certainly mattered were those of Matthew Shepard and James Byrd. Sadly, this marks 25 years since the tragic mur murders of both of these men. In 1998, Matthew Shepard, a 21-year-old gay student at the University of Wyoming, was robbed, tortured, tied to a fence along a country road, and left to die by two men who offered him a ride home from a local bar. That same year, James Byrd Jr., a 49-year-old black man living in Jasper, Texas, also accepted a ride home from three men. They drove him to the remote edge of town where they beat him severely tied him by the ankles to the back of a pickup truck and dragged him to his death. The families of Matthew Shepard and of James Byrd joined a coalition of advocates and civil rights groups who pushed Congress to strengthen the federal hate crimes laws that we have, and they were successful. The Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was signed into law and stands as one of the most powerful tools in the fight against hate crimes today. The Justice Department leverages this important tool to address violent hate crimes and to bring perpetrators to justice. We'll hear from the family of Matthew Shepard in a moment, but first I'm honored to be joined now by Houston Police Department Senior Police Officer, Jamie Bird Grant. Officer Bird Grant is a 12 year veteran of the Houston Police Department. She's also the youngest daughter of James Bird Jr. and a long time racial justice advocate. At the age of 16, Officer Bird Grant and her family were a driving force for the passage of the James Bird Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act in Texas, as well as the federal Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr. Federal Hate Crimes Prevention Act. She is the director of the James Byrd Jr. Foundation for Kids, a nonprofit organization. She's author of Triumph Over Tragedy, which outlines her personal story. And she's also deeply involved in the fight against anti-Semitism and hate through her partnership with the Houston Coalition Against Hate and the Anti-Defamation League. Ms. Uh, Bird Grant, it is great to have you here today. I just wanna acknowledge how special it is 
uh, to have you with us. I want to thank you for your strength and your courage and for being with us to share your personal testimony and your story with us at the Justice Department and with listeners who've joined us from across the country today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity as well. Thank you. Officer Bert Brandt, um, you were in high school um, when your father, James Bird, was brutally murdered. Um, mm -hmm. In your book, Triumph Over Tragedy, which I read and really enjoy, you talk candidly and powerfully about your feelings at age 16 about what it meant to secure justice for your father. I was wondering if you can open us up today by talking about uh, talking about that. What did justice, what does justice for your father mean? Um, again, thank you for this opportunity and greetings to everyone. Yes, um, at the age of 16, I thought as a 16 year old, um, I wanted those three monsters is what I identified them as to be chained to the back of a pickup truck, face sprayed with black paint and beaten and dragged for three miles down a rural rugged road, just as they did my dad. At 16, that was justice for me. I didn't see I didn't see it any other way. I didn't really have faith in the justice system um, because I wanted to take things in my own hands. And although I was raised on Christian principles and my family was immediately forgiving, I stood on what I believed at that moment. And that was justice for me. And although I, I did not turn the other cheek at that moment, I knew that I could not go on and have a prosperous life with, with that type of heart. Um, so I had to somewhat forgive along the way, which now at 40, almost 42 years old, I have found forgiveness um, because I wanted to live with peace and prosperity. And I didn't want to give those three individuals um, that much power any longer. I um, want to talk about um, how you've been able to channel all that you went through as a, as a young person. Uh, just talk about your journey to becoming a police officer. Um, in your book, you um, talk about um, how important it was to have a police department that represents the diversity of the community that it serves. Um, Wondered if you could just share about share a little bit about what inspired you to serve your community in this way. Being a part of the fourth largest uh, police department in the nation, that that told me something, and that told me that I did have a chance to make a change within the most diverse law enforcement or police department in the nation, and I am I'm glad that I have been given the opportunity by my superiors to, to be able to make that change in the community. It was hard for me in the beginning because being a survivor and also being victimized on the police force, it, it had me thinking, was I doing, was I in this line of work um, for the right reason? And, but going forward 12 years, almost 13 years later, I know that I am in the right place and I am with the right department to make the change um, for the better and for the nation. There's a, um, a powerful quote in your book uh, where you said you decided to join the police department to be a beacon of light to others who have lost loved ones due to a heinous crime and to combat racism. I just want to thank you uh, for your service and thank you for standing up. Uh, for your community and serving in this really powerful way. Um, the Department of Justice has created a very important program that is named for your father that funds hate crime prevention efforts. The Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr. Hate Crimes Program has funded hate crimes prevention efforts in 12 different states and your agency, the Houston Police Department is one of the award recipients. And I'm so glad to hear that you are co-leading the grant 
for your force and wondered if you could talk about your agency's plans for using the funding. Yes, well, HPD is focusing more on training the trainer as well as training law enforcement because we are not oblivious to the fact that law enforcement may not know what a hate crime is, what a hate crime incident is versus um, a hate speech. And we want to make sure as a department that we are leading the force and that we know as officers um, what hate crime entails so we can do a better job as identifying these incidents whenever we are encountering them in the community. And also uh, building that bridge within the community and also equipping the community with that knowledge and that educational tool so we all can work together to combat hate. And I always say, if we don't have the conversations, then change will never be made. And that is, that is something that is hard for me um, to, to not talk about my story and to share uh, what has happened to me and my dad over 25 years ago. But I know it is very vital to continue this work and to talk about it. Because again, if conversations are not had, change will not be made. And um, that is one thing with this grant that I'm grateful that we are able over the course of the four years, um, each year has focuses on different community partners. And so this year we will focus on the first year law enforcement. Excellent, that's great. Uh, we're really proud of our partnership with the Houston Police Department and really look forward to seeing the impact and results that you're able to have in the road ahead. But I wanted to circle back now to talking about your father's memory, to talking about James Bird. Articles in a number of media outlets, including the Washington Post and Texas Tribune have reported that the town where your father lost his life uh, would like to forget this atrocity, even as your dad's grave is repeatedly vandalized. One article also mentioned that the state's most used history textbook, Texas History, published uh, by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, doesn't mention your father. I wondered if you'd share your perspective about this. It's very disheartening to know that um, he is not acknowledged in the textbooks. And again, if, you know, I feel like our history as black people are being watered down and we are, it's, it's not allowing us to know the truth. And when we, we don't know the truth, of our history, we won't know what our future lies. And that is very disheartening. And also speaking to politicians in Jasper over the years, and I'm quoted, we would like to keep Jasper known for the jewel of the forest. That's like a slap in the face to me and my family because that tells us that you just wanna sweep under the rug what happened to my dad and you don't wanna acknowledge the pain that that this brutal crime has affected the community. There are people there that grew up with my dad and this is still affecting them, just as it is myself and my family. And when you wanna keep something known as the Jasper, known as the jewel of the forest, that tells me that you wanna forget about what happened. And how can we move forward as a community and as a nation if we don't acknowledge the hurt and the pain that caused this act to happen. And as far as the textbooks, that's also disappointing that no one wants to acknowledge the true history of, of hate crime and what happened to a black man on June 7th. Well, um, we at the Justice Department will never uh, forget your father. Um, we are proud to use a law that bears his name uh, to carry out work that's really critical to healing and really critical to standing up for some of the most vulnerable communities in our country. I wanted to close by asking you to share a little bit more about your father. Um, I know that he used to uh, sing um, yeah. 
And uh, I know that you you all had Bird Family Day where the family would often get together uh, and spend time together. Wondered if for our audience, you just share a little bit more about uh, your dad and how you want the world to remember him. Remember him as? A father. A musician, I'm sorry. He was very witty. He was the jokester of our family. And people used to call him a free bird because he took life as it is, day by day. And as you said, he was a very, very great musician. Loved to sing and play the piano at the same time. Um, he would make up songs and sound just like um, Al Green or Prince. And those, were, those are the memories that I remember of him singing and playing the piano, playing basketball with us, and just being that jokester of the family, never taking a day as, even the day of his last day on earth, he was joking and laughing up till the very last minute. That was my dad. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. Um, thanking you. Thank you for leaving us with that very heartfelt remembrance about your dad. Your dad should be alive today. I know it's not easy and we're so grateful to you for finding the courage to serve your community as a law enforcement today, law enforcement officer today. Uh, we will, Officer Bird Grant, continue to carry your father's legacy honorably forward as we do this important work. Thank you for sharing your, your personal story. Thank you for talking to us about your professional journey. And thank you and your family for the continued advocacy and leadership that you uh, convey to all of us. We are so incredibly admi adm admirable and grateful to you for being here today. Thank you. And thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. I want to um, turn now to another family who, like Officer uh, Bird Grant, has spent the last quarter century of their lives, 25 years, fighting against hate. Matthew Shepard's parents, Dennis and Judy, have provided um, compelling testimony regarding the importance of education in preventing hate-fueled action, specifically teaching young people about uh, basic principles of tolerance, compassion, and appreciation for differences. And we're so grateful that they could join us via recorded remarks to discuss their efforts in light of ju the Justice Department's United Against Hate program. We wanna thank you for including us in the program today. We certainly wish we could have been there in person, but since it's been 25 years since we lost Matt, I feel like we're living on an airplane, but we really appreciate this opportunity. So it's been 25 years, we've seen great progress in our particular community, LGBTQ+, but also a little bit of black sighting, backsliding, which is why I'm so appreciative of DOJ and their United Against Hate program. It's become really important and critical now that we engage communities and community leaders in what we're trying to accomplish in preventing hate crimes. And I feel that that's all about education and getting to know your local law enforcement agency as well as DOJ. I know there's a level of antitrust right now for law enforcement, but we feel that the way to get around that is there is a saying that we use, get to know me before you need me, which means it's a commitment of the office, but also of the community to take charge of what they actually know and learn and how they can be helped. It's important, as Judy just said, that know me before you need me. Not only does law enforcement and their liaison representatives need to go out into the various communities to, to build up that trust, 
but the communities themselves, especially those with immigrants who come from countries where they're afraid of the police force, they need to have leaders who are willing to go to law enforcement and the DOJ to build up that trust and build up the uh, working relationship that everybody needs in order to push this forward. We were really lucky with our law enforcement personnel when we lost Matt. They were very kind and professional and learned and grew, grew in their own acceptance of the gay community. This is really critical for understanding and empathy. And we were so grateful for them for treating us like just kindness with kindness. I just really encourage that for our law enforcement to engage. And, and the United, we stand united basically means that we are all in this together. All the communities, marginalized communities need to stand together, be educated on what their rights are, what their responsibilities are, and what they need to do to uh, assist law enforcement from DOJ all the way down to your local law enforcement in order to succeed to make this a safe uh, place for everyone to live in. We look forward to the United Against Hate program expanding and becoming more known among all the communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much and have a great conference. Special thanks to Officer Bird Brandt and Mr. and Mrs. Shepard for sharing their critically important voices with Assistant Attorney General Clark and all of us today. We genuinely appreciate having this space to reflect on James's and Matthew's lives and legacies, as well as to explore what we can do now and in our own communities to strengthen partnerships with law enforcement to counter unlawful acts of hate. We will now turn to our first panel of U.S. attorneys directly involved in the Justice Department's United Against Hate Community Outreach and Engagement Program. Our moderator for this panel is Dina Keene, the U.S. Attorney for the Western Dis District of North Carolina. Ms. King also serves as the chair of the Civil Rights Subcommittee of the Attorney General's uh, Advisory Committee. Ms. King will introduce the other panelists. Let us please welcome U.S. Attorney King. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon. The Department of Justice is united against hate Community Outreach Program is a national initiative that connects federal, state, and local law enforcement with local communities to combat hate crimes and incidents. The United Against Hate Program is carried out by the offices of United States attorneys like myself, who enforce the nation's laws in each of the 94 federal districts. The United Against Hate Program is part of the Department of Justice's consolidated response to Attorney General Garland's March 2021 directive to boost efforts to fight hate-based crimes and incidents. The United Against Hate Program was developed through collaboration by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, the Executive Office for United States Attorneys, the Community Relations Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Community Oriented Policing Services Office, and the Office of Justice Programs. In early 2022, the United Against Hate program was piloted in three United States attorneys' offices, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and the Eastern District of Washington. Following the success of the pilot, the project was expanded to 16 more United States attorney offices in summer of 2022. The United Against Hate program is designed to connect federal, state, and local law enforcement with local communities, including those that have been historically marginalized and may be especially vulnerable to hate crimes and bias-motivated incidents. The program not only educates community members about hate crimes and hate incidents, but also helps to build trust between community and law enforcement and to strengthen local networks to combat unlawful acts of hate. In September of 2022, the White House hosted the United We Stand Summit to rally a nationwide response to prevent, respond to, and recover from hate-fueled violence. The White House announced a package of new actions the federal government was currently taking at the time or would be taking, along with civic, faith, 
philanthropic and business leaders to address hate-fueled violence and advance national unity. The Department of Justice selected the United Against Hate Community Outreach Program as the department's key deliverable for the summit. During the summit, the Attorney General announced that all 94 United States attorney offices would implement the program by September of 2023. With excitement, we met that goal. The United Against Hate program has now been implemented in all 94 United States attorney offices across the country, providing education about hate crimes and bias motivated incidents and strengthening connections between the community and law enforcement. Participants of the program and community partners included religious groups, educational institutions, advocacy organizations, national, state, tribal, and local civil rights organizations, and local chambers of commerce, among many others. In addition to community partners, United States Attorney Offices also partnered with local, state, and tribal law enforcement agencies to discuss local enforcement and to emphasize the importance of reporting hate crimes and hate incidents. Many United States Attorney Offices also partnered with other Department of Justice components, such as the FBI and the Community Relations Service, as well as other federal agencies to discuss issues such as physical security at places of worship. United States Attorney Offices have hosted and attended United Against Hate events that have ranged from small collaborative dialogues with community leaders to large community-wide events, including more than 200 people. These events have been held in a variety of settings, including churches, local schools and universities, libraries, art galleries, and community centers. Each district tailors their own United Against Hate program to meet the unique needs and experiences of the local community. Some events focus on specific audiences like faith leaders or high school students or the LGBTQI plus community, while others highlight the impact on survivors and the importance of victim support. Dic discussions include topics such as identifying hate crimes and hate incidents and the importance of reporting both options for responding to hate incidents that are not crimes and distinguishing unlawful conduct from speech protected by the First Amendment. Since the program's launch, more than 200 events have been held nationwide with over 6,000 total participants. Many United States attorney offices have held or are planning different events and meeting with different communities in their district. In my district, the Western District of North Carolina, we launched United Against Hate with outreach to Charlotte's Sikh community. The Sikh community in my district has been traditionally vulnerable for a number of reasons. Their Gurdwara, which is the Sikh's place of worship, had been vandalized and individuals of the Sikh community have been the victims of racial slurs, aggression, religious intolerance, and even assault. This has resulted in a group feeling marginalized and quite frankly, intimidated and fearful at times. However, the Sikhs have been willing partners to my office and to law enforcement and have been very receptive to our efforts to partner with them on reporting incidents and what precautionary methods they can take to increase safety in and around their place of worship, their homes, and while out and about in the community. Our initial meeting was attended by more than 200 members at the United Sikhs Gurdwara, where members of my civil rights team and our federal and local law enforcement met with Sikh representatives. This led to me being invited to address the broader Sikh community at the 2023 United Sikh Summit, where I spoke to Sikhs representing communities from all over the country about United Against Hate and the department's efforts to raise awareness and in incident reporting our role in protecting civil rights and combating hate crimes and hate incidents, and generally letting participants know how to reach out to law enforcement when needed. In addition to conducting outreach with the Sikh community, 
My district also partnered with the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District, which is the largest school district in Western North Carolina. And we organized the United Against Hate Summit with 150 high school students. Members of my office presented on topics of conflict resolution, inclusion, identifying and reporting hateful behavior, and how to foster respect, acceptance, and promote inclusion in the school setting and beyond. We're in the process of planning a second school summit of a larger magnitude and duplicating that event in other school districts throughout Western North Carolina. As you see, United Against Hate has had an overwhelmingly positive impact in the communities that participated in the program. It helped establish a direct line of communication between the United States Attorney offices and their communities. The program helped to build trust between community members and law enforcement. And United Against Hate provided United States Attorney offices and law enforcement with the opportunity to develop a better understanding of community issues and concerns when it comes to hate crimes and hate incidents. And the program also provided a safe space for survivors to share their stories and to speak about the issues impacting their community. These are a few testimonials from the United States Attorney offices and community members that participated in United Against Hate events. One quote, after an event geared toward the LGBTQI plus community, one of the student attendees reached out to the assistant United States attorney. The student said that the event was the first time in his life that he felt like law enforcement was offering him a helping hand. He said he was aware of unreported hate crimes on campus and was so inspired by the event that he was hoping to start a working group at the law school with student leaders and local law enforcement designed to increase the reporting of hate crimes and incidents. That quote comes to us from the United States Attorney Office in the District of Arizona. From the Eastern District of North Carolina, our United Against Hate event partly focused on the trauma experienced by hate crime victims, how long the trauma lasts, and the importance of victims speaking up and speaking out. Our victim witness coordinator and people who were victims of hate crimes spoke at our program. It was moving and powerful for our audience to hear from victims and to see the damage hate crimes leave behind. The program was very well received. From the Western District of Michigan, our United Against Hate outreach has already borne fruit and it was facilitated helpful communication between the United States Attorney and a local rabbi whose congregation was the target of recent threats. On June 8th, 2023, we hosted a virtual United Against Hate event with Jewish leaders across the district. About a week later, on June 16th, a 19-year-old suspect was arrested by the FBI for making anti-Semitic threats of a mass shooting targeting a local synagogue. The rabbi of the targeted synagogue had participated in our United Against Hate meeting and had a direct line of communication with the United States Attorney. Not only did United Against Hate strengthen the office's relationship with the targeted synagogue, but it helped build trust and goodwill with Jewish leaders and community members across the district and the state. As you see, these statements reflect the widespread impact United Against Hate has had across the country in terms of building trust in law enforcement, establishing direct lines of communication, building alliances, and increasing reporting, which are some of the key goals of the United Against Hate program. The department's hope is that United Against Hate continues to have a lasting impact across the country. And so far, things are headed in the right direction. Many United States attorney offices have hosted additional United Against Hate events since their first initial event. And many offices are looking into creating or bolstering existing working groups and alliances that focus on addressing hate crimes and hate incidents in their communities. Let's now turn to our panelists to hear about the United Against Hate programs in their districts, what impact they've had so far, and their plans for the future. 
I am honored to be joined by my colleagues, Philip Sillinger, the United States Attorney for the District of New Jersey, Joshua Herwick, the United States Attorney for the District of Idaho, and Roger Hanberg, the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Florida. Philip, we'll start first with you. Since New Jersey was one of the districts that piloted the United Against Hate program, you have about 18 months experience with this program. Can you tell us about your program so far and your plans for the future? Thanks, Dina. My office was one of the three pilot offices that launched United Against Hate. For our first event, we built on existing relationships, deep existing relationships with law enforcement and community partners. We held a large event at a university. We didn't focus on one group in particular. Instead, we invited communities from across the state. And our goal was to kick United Against Hate off with as many groups as possible and then follow up in subsequent events with specific groups. We were joined at our first event by Assistant Attorney General Clark after she and I spoke together with the FBI and the New, New Jersey Attorney General's office. AUSAs from my office presented on United Against Hate. And after that, we had a smaller listening session, which was very vibrant with group leaders from around the community and largely listened to them express their concern. Representatives of the Jewish and Muslim communities, Black and Hispanic communities, LGBTQ+, disability rights, and various civil rights groups. It was a really engaging discussion that led to a number of follow-up discussions and invitations to speak with their groups. As we had hoped, this initial event served as a springboard for many subsequent events. After the event, we received numerous requests to meet with communities. And in response, we held targeted events with the Muslim, Jewish, Black, Asian American, and many other communities. Some were very large, some were small in the basement of a mosque or the breakfast of a uh, community center, but all were worth, worthwhile. And we were also asked to speak at state and local law enforcement partners events, interfaith events, and uh, matters of that sort. And the dozens of other community engagement events that we generally hold, we incorporated United Against uh, Hate into them. And these events together helped us strengthen our communities, uh, uh, our relations, excuse me, with uh, existing communities that we already had these deep relationships with, but also introduced us to others. And as a result of these connections, when we had hate incidents in the state, uh, we were able to respond and more directly and quickly communicate. Thank you, Philip. Josh, let's turn next to you. I know that Idaho launched its United Against Hate program over a year ago and has had a variety of events with different partners, including tribal representatives. Can you tell us about your experience and any plans for the future? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dina. And hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be, be with you for this important program. Um, you know, much like I think what Philip has done, <clears throat> excuse me, in New Jersey, uh, you know, we started with listening sessions. And in Idaho, uh, as you know, it's a large state geographically. And so we sort of went region by region. Um, starting in North Idaho about oh, about a year ago and met with local leaders, including um, we have three tribes in that region. So leaders from that tribe, uh, those tribes, and you know, tried to understand what was going on um, in that part of Idaho and see what would be most useful as we rolled out this program. Um, for our first large event, which came out of that initial listening session, uh, we partnered with uh, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, uh, which is in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and at their uh, event space in their casino, um, had a large public event with over 200 people um, where the FBI spoke, uh, local partners, local law enforcement partners spoke. Um, and for me, the most meaningful part was to have tribal members and other uh, community leaders from North Idaho talk about the experiences that they had. And many of you probably know Idaho 
in North Idaho in particular, um, has had a long, sad history with white supremacy, which has been resurgent recently. Um, so to talk about how we've dealt with that as a community um, in the past and how we're gonna deal with it again in the future. So that was sort of our model and we've replicated that um, in all other parts of Idaho uh, at this point, and we're gonna just continue going. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna be back up in, in North Idaho working with one of our other tribes, the Kootenai tribe of Idaho, to host a similar public event um, based on the same model. Great work, Josh, thank you for that. Roger, let's turn next to you. You first implemented the United Against Hate program earlier this year, but I know that your plans have now taken on an increased urgency in the aftermath of the Jacksonville murders. Could you tell us about that? Yes, and uh, thank you, Dina, and, and thank you uh, uh, to uh, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and the Attorney General for having me here uh, with everyone today on this important program. So we started our program um, earlier this year. Um, so I've been a federal prosecutor uh, for over 20 years here in the Middle District of Florida. And for those of you who aren't familiar with U.S. Attorney's offices, we are the uh, prosecutors from the United States Department of Justice who live and work in your community. And so from my uh, experience uh, being a federal prosecutor in the Middle District of Florida, I've known for a long time how important uh, community engagement uh, has been uh, to our office here in terms of our uh, law enforcement response. Uh, so I, I thought it was a great idea to, to really have a focus on uh, hate crimes uh, through this program, United Against Hate, because it is, is it, it's an issue that all of us deal with on, on a, a sadly regular basis. Uh, the Assistant Attorney General talked about just some cases from October, and, and I think if she went through every month of the calendar year, you would hear uh, about every office uh, of the 94 U.S. attorneys. So I knew how important it was. So, uh, you know, our rollout, we did a traditional rollout. We did with, um, uh, uh, you know, some service organization, a school. And, and then everything, at least for me, changed in August um, when we had the uh, terribly racistly motivated attack uh, in Jacksonville uh, that resulted in the, in the murders of three people. Uh, and at that point, as I was thinking about the response uh, that my office was going to have for our community, I decided to, to really focus our efforts on United Against Hate and, and really try to take it uh, to the next level. So I, I did a couple things. Uh, you know, most people associate the United States Attorney's offices with doing prosecutions, and, and that is a very large part of what we do. But we're also part of the Justice Department. And there's a lot of grants and technical assistance that the Justice Department and the Department of Homeland Security provide to deal with and, and prevent uh, hate crimes. Uh, so one of the things I did was I, I got an opportunity to talk to uh, the various component heads at, at the department. And what I wanted to do, because I think one of the things we try to do uh, in terms of creating trust and legitimacy is, is frankly doing a better job of directly communicating uh, what's available. And, and I wanted to do that with grants and technical assistance uh, that's available to nonprofits, it's available to educational institutions, it's available to governments. So we took that and, and we, we took that information and we, we put it on our website uh, in our United Against Hate portion uh, of our website. So that was one thing that I, I wanted to do. The, the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to really expand our program. Um, and so I put out a call to the attorneys uh, in my office, uh, and now we have trained uh, 25 lawyers uh, in my office to be able to do these programs. And we're in the process now uh, of reaching out to uh, a host of different organizations and, and groups uh, to schedule prosecution, to schedule presentations, not prosecutions, schedule presentations, because I just think it's an essential part of the work that we do to have and I often call them two-way conversations with the members of the community. I mean, part of it is, is to talk about what a hate crime is, to talk about hate crime reporting, but it's also to hear uh, directly from our community uh, in, in terms of the issues of concern for them. Because I think trust and legitimacy um, often requires us uh, you know, to be effective. And, and, and to be effective, I know one frustration people often have with government is they don't know if they if they give a complaint or if they say something, anything's going to happen with it. And part of our goal is to provide points of contact with people in my office and to express our interest and desire to know more about these incidents and where appropriate to to get that information to the law enforcement partner who might be able to do something. Because we 
we do care about our community and we do want to make sure that these cases are appropriately investigated. Um, and part of that requires us to have uh, and, and, you know, direct communications uh, with the members of our community. Uh, you know, recently we, we've, um, uh, we, we've also expanded our efforts on protecting places of worship. Um, so we heard about, you know, the Attorney General's uh, directive to the United States attorneys to focus on cases that might involve threats against religious organizations. Um, and uh, uh, and that those are definitely uh, real and those are definitely out there. So for instance, last week, uh, we partnered with the city in ja of Jacksonville. We partnered with the FBI, Homeland Security and the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office to put on a protecting places of worship um, a seminar for, for the members of the community who are gonna be concerned about those issues. And, and these aren't unique programs to the Middle District of Florida. Um, wherever you are located, uh, just feel free to reach out to your United States attorney to ask about the United Against Hate program. And if you have an interest in protecting places of worship, uh, it's a really excellent program. And the feedback we've gotten on both of the programs uh, has, has really been great. I mean, for, for a number of people, it's the first time they've had any direct contact uh, with the department. And, and for us, we just get so much out of having those contacts with the members of our community. Thank you, Roger. I want to now turn and talk a little bit about impact, and I'm going to ask each of you a different question. So, Philip, I'll start first with you. Um, can you expand upon how and in what way the United Against Hate program has made a difference in your district? Sure. Thanks, Dana. Um, we've had a number of uh, hate incidents uh, in our district. Uh, we've had situations where a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a synagogue where uh, an individual was charged with committing five carjackings of visibly identifiable members of the Orthodox Jewish community and stabbing one of them. Uh, a threat to blow up a synagogue and synagogues, which prompted a statewide FBI alert, which caused a lot of concern uh, in the uh, Jewish community and uh, hate speech incidents against the Muslim community. And our uh, efforts and relationships developed or created by United Against Hate have made such a difference in the way that we were able to address these because after these hate crimes were committed or threatened or hate speech was directed at the communities who were represented at our events, members of my office were able to quickly and directly connect with many members of the impact community that we had previously worked with in United Against Hate. And some of these incidents resulted in hate crime charges. Some of them resulted in federal charges, which were not uh, charged as hate crimes. And in one incident, uh, it was not actionable at all. But the connections that we either created in United Against Hate or further strengthened and developed through those programs, whether we were able to take law enforcement action or not, helped us build or deepen the trust with these communities. And as has been mentioned so many times today, trust between law enforcement and the community is so important not only to effective law enforcement, but effective reporting and confidence in the community to report hate crimes, which promotes law enforcement effectiveness. That's great. The connecting with law enforcement and increased victim reporting, key aspects of United Against Hate. Josh, what did community members find to be most effective with your United Against Hate program? Yeah, our, our experiences have, have mirrored you know, what Philip laid out, but I wanted to, to share a story that I think um, indicates what we are able to achieve when we bring people together. Um, and this goes back to that first event we held in, in North Idaho about a year ago. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, was, there were several groups of, of, of people that expressed an interest in, in the event with some skepticism about what message we would be sharing and um, you know, would it be sort of overreached by the federal government? If you know Idaho, there's there's always that sentiment floating around. So we had some people to, to, that showed up to our first event that were frankly very skeptical of the department and the messaging. Um, 
they were, of course, welcomed with respect and, and friendship like everyone else. And friend of mine is that she was that had come into conflict with her previously for unrelated reasons um, in their individual Josh, um, we're as they heard, we were having a little bit of difficulty with your audio, but I think you're coming through clear okay. now. Okay, I apologize. So I was, I was trying to explain there was some individual seated at a table that had been in conflict previously. Um, and as they they heard the message um, that's steeped in the rule of law, that's based on just human dignity and mutual respect, and then connecting, of course, with law enforcement as well. Um, what I was told was that you know there was a, a development of at least a recognition um, of the humanity and the dignity of, of everyone at that table, um, despite their differences on, on a variety of issues. To me, that's that's exactly what you know this type of event can bring to our communities, in addition to building that infrastructure and that, those connections between our offices and marginalized groups, and then those groups and law enforcement. Um, you know, if we step back a little bit broader, you know, we are all united in our humanity and in the uh, constitutional rights of Americans. And so that's just one story that made uh, a path here and doing something that's really productive in Iowa. That's a great point. The relationships that happen um, amongst members of our community, excellent point. Roger, what's your district's biggest takeaway from United Against Hate? I would say it, it for me, reinforced something that, that, that I think I, I, I knew, but is always great to see, which is uh, just the, the, the power that, that that people have when they realize they're they're not alone. I mean that that is one of the reasons we really want to reach out is because we want the members of our community who are experiencing you know these these terrible incidents uh, and acts to know that that they're not alone. I mean you know we really are united and we really are here. Um, and all of us uh, who are on this panel. I mean we're the United States attorneys uh, for the people who we serve in the districts. Uh, that we serve. And, uh, you know, one of the other big takeaways I have is just all of the positive things that come uh, from interactions. And, and, you know, frankly, we've had some tough conversations sometimes, but I think they've been conversations worth having. And, and I know that we've been better off, uh, you know, for, for having those conversations and for getting a chance to, to engage with the members of our community. And, you know, we already see an increased trust. We already see increased reporting. Um, and, and I think those benefits are, are really going to be important as we all work together to, to be united against aid. Thank you so much. I want to thank AG Garland, Assistant AG Clark, um, each of the panelists that have joined me today, and then everyone that's participating in today's program. Your insights, ideas, thoughtful approach, and collaborations have really helped us to advance the mission of United Against Hate and helped us to build a program that's truly impactful in our respective communities. In the program for today's event, you'll find a whole suite of hate crimes enforcement and prevention resources. At the very back, you'll see we've summarized all the work our panelists just spoke about. The document is entitled United Against Hate Community Outreach and Engagement Program 2022 to 2023. We'll also be linking to that document on the department's hate crimes website. So please watch out for it there at www.justice.gov backslash hate crime. It's also been placed in your chat. We want to make our communities stronger, make our communities safer, and make our communities more united because it's about helping people in all communities to live, thrive and prosper knowing they can go to work, go to school and raise children in safe environments. United Against Hate is an impactful initiative because it's a promise to the community, a promise to protect civil rights and civil liberties, a promise to eradicate crimes and violence fueled by hate and a promise to enforce our nation's laws to prevent and protect everyone from being victimized or live in fear of being targeted by hate-motivated acts. 
Federal prosecutors and law enforcement are the first line of defense in protecting the constitutional rights of all those who live in this country. Each of us has, has taken an oath to carry out this obligation and this promise to all of our communities, equally and at all times. But as we're well aware, we cannot do this alone. Our success rests on the strong partnerships with our communities and forging relationships that encourage community members to come forward, to call out and denounce hate, and to report hate-fueled incidents wherever they occur. Stopping hateful actions begins with awareness, and awareness begins with holding community events like those presented today, and to educate the public on our role in protecting their rights, and more importantly, to invite the community to be our eyes and our ears, and to alert us to issues, incidents, or problems that might otherwise be hard to detect. So to our community members, I urge you to not only speak against hate, but to act against hate and to help us create communities where hate is not even an option, where hateful acts are no longer part of our experience. Thank you again for participating and above all, thank you for your efforts. I'm certain that each of us leaves here more encouraged and motivated to continue our work to advance the department's mission of United Against Hate, and that is to increase community understanding and reporting of hate crimes, to strengthen alliances by bringing together community groups, community leaders, and law enforcement, and to build trust and strengthen coordination to combat unlawful acts of hate. Our collective efforts have been extraordinary, and this is just the beginning. Thank you, and keep up the great work. Thank you, U.S. Attorneys King, Hanberg, Curate, and Selinger for those compelling firsthand accounts of how the United Against Hate campaign is succeeding in helping to build trust with communities across the country. My name is Sheila Foran, and I'm the Special Legal Counsel in the Civil Rights Division's Policy and Strategy Section. I also lead the Department's Hate Crimes Enforcement and Prevention Initiative. I'll be moderating our next panel, which focuses on how we can center survivor stories and community voices to achieve change, including in the context of the program you just heard about, the Justice Department's United Against Hate program. With us here today are Nadia Aziz, Senior Program Director of the Fighting Hate and Bias Program at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, Pardeep Kaleka, Co-Director, Not in Our Town, Rabbi Hazan Jeffrey Myers, Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Eric Olshan, U.S. Attorney, Western District of Pennsylvania, and Anisha Singh, Executive Director, SIP Coalition. We're so honored that all of you could join us. Rabbi Myers, I want to start, if I may, with you. Five years ago last week, the horrific attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue stole the lives of 11 innocent victims, critically wounding seven others. This summer, jurors found the perpetrator guilty on 63 counts. Throughout, you served in multiple roles as witness, survivor, and leader of your congregation. What insights can you share regarding your community's experience during the investigation and prosecution of this case? Thank you for the uh, invitation to participate today. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not just acknowledge uh, uh, the difference between the Jewish calendar and the solar calendar. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar based on the cycle of the moon, which means a lunar year is 354 days. So a date on a Jewish calendar is not the same date every year on a solar calendar. That's my way of saying that we observe uh, and commemorate the deaths of loved ones based on the Jewish calendar. So although October 27th is the public date where we gather uh, as a city, uh, there's also the Jewish date uh, when we remember our loved ones, we let memorial candles and offer prayers. That begins this evening at sundown. So I'd be remiss if not acknowledging uh, for those who, who know uh, the Jewish term, the Yort site, the commemorative date of, of our 11 loved ones. May their memories be for a blessing. 
how to move a community forward, um, particularly when there's no experience in this, um, has been an incredible challenge. Uh, it's not like I could call another rabbi and say, what did you do? Uh, I've been fortunate to, uh, over time, develop really wonderful relationships with a number of faith leaders who've been able to advise and be sounding boards on, on that ultimate question of how to move forward. Uh, and it's in so many areas because while we're in the process of raising the funds to rebuild the Tree of Life, it's one thing to rebuild uh, brick and mortar. It's another thing to rebuild uh, lost faith uh, to restore enough confidence that you can attend services in safety and security, to feel that God is still there in answering your prayers. And those are just not easy. And there's no specific prescription that you can offer that just is a one size fits all solution. So every individual, not just in my congregation, but in the other two congregations that were impacted, as well as the vast community, each has a specific way of coping and dealing. And uh, there's no one answer that I can offer to say, this is what we did and it works. It's literally the hard work of one by one, gathering hopefully more allies to be able to work together as a community, to be able to find ways to restore uh, community. COVID didn't help either. Um, so when you have the whammy of COVID, as well as all of this, uh, and you add to that the fact that we have not been in our home synagogue since the shooting, but it was clear that it was no longer a place that we could worship. It was defiled. Um, so we've been in another synagogue. No, no matter how wonderful hosts are, we're homeless. So it's really hard to rebuild community when the real mooring of a faith community is their place of worship, and we don't have one yet. We still have a temporary home. So there's still all these unresolved issues. It's given us time to reflect upon who we are becoming. What are our responsibilities to each other? What responsibilities do we have to the greater community? And to reflect on all of those, which is what I've spent a lot of time doing, but not just reflect, but act upon. Who should we become? What are our responsibilities now moving forward? And uh, hopefully now that the trial is concluded, um, we have time to be able to move forward on those, uh, those questions. Uh, and I'd also be remiss if I did not acknowledge the incredible efforts of the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, headed by our own Eric Olshan, who's on this uh, program now, the FBI, uh, all of the... Uh, law enforcement personnel and special responders, um, because it took a community to be able to get through this together. And um, I just felt that uh, the efforts uh, of our community and all those that I've just mentioned uh, made an incredible difference in our lives. Thank you so much, Rabbi Myers. I wanna turn now to US Attorney Eric Olshan, who was a key member of the prosecution team Mr. Olshan, can you speak to your team's approach with respect to survivors and witnesses in the Tree of Life community? Sure, uh, it's good to be with everybody today. Um, it's always good to see Rabbi Myers. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the most important things to think about is that you can't assume trust um, with any victim community. And so, you know, our office had done a number of um, outreach efforts over the years. We had been in touch with the Jewish community um, in Pittsburgh about hate crime enforcement. So we had some, um, uh, we had some interaction already, but in the wake of a horrific incident of mass violence that's uh, motivated by hate, um, you know, you are dealing with a very, uh, uh, um, a very traumatic situation where people are dealing with their own personal and communal trauma. Uh, and at the same time, um, at the U.S. Attorney's Office and working with our partners in law enforcement, we are trying to investigate and prosecute a crime. And so um, as we interact with um, the victim community, it's we knew that um, trust was not something that was assumed. 
Um, and so what we had to do was we had to build that. We had to start with just communication, establishing a line of communication between law enforcement, our office, um, to the victim community, which um, in this case was quite large. Um, and so what that meant was just having um, uh, initial interactions with uh, um, individuals who were um, at the synagogue, um, people who were wounded um, at the appropriate time. And that meant working with our victim witness um, support staff, both at the U.S. Attorney's Office and also through FBI. We are so lucky here in Pittsburgh that we have such incredible um, victim witness um, support uh, staff. They really were the lifeline between us um, and the victim community. Uh, but we also thought it was really important that the witnesses and the victims knew the prosecutors, um, not because we wanted to start talking to people about what a trial would look like or what the facts were and what they could remember, but just so they knew who we are. And that even though, you know, we were approaching what happened from a particular standpoint as um, investigators and prosecutors, we're also a member of the community. Um, we might not be members of the same victimized community or targeted community necessarily, but we're all members of the community here in Pittsburgh. Um, and so having um, prosecutors in the room to just meet with people who are witnesses um, and to um, be in touch with family members of those who lost their lives was something that we thought was very important. Um, in part because you never know how long an investigation or prosecution will take. Uh, from the time of the shooting until the beginning of trial was ex almost exactly four and a half years. And so being able to um, respect um, the victim community um, and maintain that line of communication over a long period of time was really something that was um, essential to what we were trying to do. And hopefully it was very important and meaningful to the victim community. Um, uh, when it came time ultimately for us to um, to prepare for the trial this year, we already had established connections with um, many of the um, uh, many of the witnesses. Um, Rabbi Myers and I hadn't met until this year, um, unfortunately for me, um, but we had an opportunity um, to get to know each other a little bit through this process. But I think Rabbi Myers knew that we, the prosecutors, had been in touch with members of his congregation, members of the victim community, um, and had established those um, that 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 open line of communication and hopefully built trust going into this um, very very difficult process of having the trial. Um, um, asking some of the victims um, and family members to be witnesses in the trial. We, um, there were 22 people who were in the synagogue that morning, 11 people died, 11 people survived. All 11 who survived testified at trial. Three people who were outside the synagogue um, trying to enter the synagogue, they testified at trial. And we had over a dozen members of the families of the 11 who died who also testified at trial. And um, we could not have done our job if we hadn't um, established that um, line of communication and eventually trust with the community um, so that um, we could get to where we, we ultimately did. And, and that's a credit not so much to us, um, but to the to the victims, the family members who were just um, so tremendous and strong throughout this process. Thank you so much, uh, U.S. Attorney Olshan. It's, it's really heartening to hear uh, from both you and Rabbi Myers that here, you know, it sounds like the system worked in terms of achieving justice and at least some measure of closure for victims and survivors and, and the witnesses. For most victims, however, a role as witness may never materialize. Uh, the police may fail to make an arrest. The offender ultimately pleads guilty and the case proceeds to sentencing without a criminal trial. So how do we center the voices of survivors, victims, and impacted communities in hate crimes prevention efforts? And to answer this question, we're gonna turn now to Pardeep Kaleka, whose nonprofit organization produced a film that documents the city of Pittsburgh's powerful community response to the Tree of Life attack. Uh, Mr. Kaleka, can you tell us about your organization and how you came to be involved in this work? Thank you so much, Sheila. And I just want to start off by just a note of just gratitude to everyone that's on this call today. <clears throat> and really thinking about the um, the power of people, just people power. And um, our organization really believes 
And that um, whether it is a prosecutable hate crime or in our case, not a non-prosecutable uh, hate crime that happens to your community, we need to believe um, in, in people and we need to believe in one another and each other and our role in um, healing and the aftermath of hate centering survivors, but then also centering uh, institutions that um, you know think about uh, where we are in our country and the institutions and the trust. And I think that we're all speaking about many of those institutions and this great democracy and what's at stake. Um, we think about the United Against Hate Summit. Um, I think about all of the organizations that are on many of these calls, the Civil Rights Division, um, the U.S. Attorney's Offices that have worked so hard over the years, uh, FBI, local law enforcement, county, federal law enforcement working in collaboration with one another. Um, you know, we had, not in our town, had amazing support over the years uh, with, uh, you know, just community-oriented police services uh, working in conjunction with them to create the film Waking in Oak Creek. Um, uh, Justin Locke from Community Relations Services who was with us in Pittsburgh and continues to work you know, to, to highlight uh, the voices of communities impacted, both in prevention and in the aftermath and, and, and mediate. Um, you know, there's so many people to thank, um, broad-based communities, civic organizations that we have here with, you know, Sikh Coalition, Nadia, the work that the rabbi has, has done. And so we all do this work together, right? We all do this work in relationship and community. And that's how NIAD got its start. 25 years ago, we, seen, we saw an uptick of uh, white supremacist hate that was happening in town in Billings, Montana. And when a Jewish family was deliberately attacked and children were attacked, the entire community stood up to hate. And basically the work that we have done over the years was to, to really highlight how local community can stand up to hate, how everyone, everyone, no matter if you're, if you're a parent and you feel like you do not have a role in this, that you in fact do, that you, if you're an educator or a teacher, and I think right now with everything that is going on in the world, people are acutely feeling this. And we believe that we do need, we do need broad-based sort of support at the federal level, but we also need that to get to the local level. And if that's gonna to get to the local level, especially local law enforcement. Uh, I'm former law enforcement, so I can, I can tell you a little bit about local law enforcement and the communities that, that they serve have a reciprocal relationship. It's not just on institutions, it's also on the people. So people have to believe in those institutions and those institutions need to believe in those people. And, and, and that's the way that we're gonna move this forward. That has always been the vision of our country and that needs to be the vision as we all move move forward, and and so that's that's the work that we do. We just utilize film and being able to document, story tell, and compel people who come to those convenings to say, "Listen, as you all leave today, do not lower your hand when 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 asked whose responsibility is it to prevent hate. Raise your hand. Each and every one of us raises our hands, and we say that you know what, I can prevent the next hate crime from happening. And that's the challenge that we face going forward." These were people who were walking alive just a week back. They are no more with us. We come together in love and peace and understanding rather than, you know, hatred. It can happen to anybody, any place, anywhere. Hatred don't care where it goes. What hurt them also hurt us too. We are Christians, we all are brothers and sisters together. That's why we're here. We came to share their grief too. Sometimes people think that when you go to a situation like this, it's over, it's done, you go home, let's do your job, you get back. It doesn't work that way. There were some pretty graphic things that went on there. They're trained to see that, but now when one of their own goes down, we need to heal behind closed doors in a group and come together and talk and cry. I would like to see them get some time to catch their breath too. She was a very hard-working woman.
she sacrificed what she wanted for herself to give us what we needed, just working for 12, 14 hours a day just to put food on the table. My dad was a strong, strong person, a strong personality. He was going to fight till the end. And sometimes, it, you know, rub people the wrong way. But he was also a very honest person, almost brutally honest. A lot of integrity. You don't know that you have these characteristics built into you until you need them. How can we look into the eye of a horrific tragedy? I seek solace in the fact that even in death, my father has done more to promote awareness of the Sikh faith than he did when he was alive. The whole concept of Sangat or community in our faith is that you as an individual cannot find truth. We must learn together to find that truth. So we're always encouraged to pray in groups, to meditate together, to interact with each other, to eat together, to serve each other in that hope. You never get used to coming into a scene where your dad took his last breath, murmuring, Vaigru, Vaigru, you know, please come save me. My mom used to be really involved in the Gudwara and helping out all the time. Still, it's hard for me. It starts shaking my heart and everything. It's a hard obstacle to try to get over. That clip is so powerful. Um, thank you, Mr. Kaleka. And I don't know if you wanted to say anything more about the clip, um, which obviously features your family, um, or about how the screening of Not In Our Town films has impacted both communities and law enforcement. I'll just uh, say something really quickly uh, that sometimes, um, you know, what. I get to represent a couple of different voices uh, within this work that we do. And uh, each and every one of those people said a prayer at the end of their life and as they transitioned. Um, I know that because I was right outside the temple at the time. I was just a little bit late. And luckily I could save my four and my six year old um, from not being inside. We, sometimes understand those prayers to be prayers of self-preservation. But um, for anybody that's lost anybody in their life due to hate or due, due to anything, uh, we've come out of an uh, incredibly difficult time of COVID and the pandemic and just us rebuilding our communities, rebuilding our sanctuaries, rebuilding what it means to be uh, in this country and American. Um, we need to harness those prayers. Um, those prayers were not for any of them. They, my dad transitioned um, and uh, he transitioned with his last words being the most purposeful prayer that you can put out. And today I want to end where I started just with a sense of gratitude for all the people that are on this call, all the people that continue to do this work um, as we do. We know that it's not just about my dad or the Sikh community or the Jewish community or the any community that's impacted, but, but it's all about, about all of us. And it's about harnessing and listening to those prayers and moving forward in that purpose. So I thank you all for the work that you all do. Um, in your heaviest and, and moments where, where it gets very, very difficult, I hope that you hear those prayers. Thank you so much, Mr. Kaleka. Um, and, and thank you for sharing your organization's experience. Uh, I did want to note that the Justice Department's United Against Hate program actually incorporates several Not In Our Town film clips. And we encourage communities and U.S. attorney's offices interested in screening these films 
to submit requests through the Not In Our Town website. These films can lead to really powerful conversations. I wanna pivot now to centering voices of advocates in hate crimes prevention. Um, Ms. Singh, as head of the largest Sikh civil rights organization in the US, can you talk about the first post 9-11 hate crime and tell us how advocates were able to educate law enforcement about its terrorizing community-wide impact. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. It truly is an honor to be alongside um, such wonderful advocates and panelists. Um, Pradeep, obviously, you know, my heart goes, goes out to you and we're so grateful at the Mystic community um, for all of your leadership, despite all the hardship. Um, yeah, so the, you know, the Sikh Coalition was founded in the days, weeks, months after 9-11, and, and one of the reasons why was um, the murder of Bobir Singh Sodhi, uh, it was a gentleman in Arizona, he had a beard and wore a turban in accordance with the Sikh faith, and he was mistakenly profiled as Arab Muslim and murdered on September 15th, just a few days after 9-11, while he was planting flowers in commemoration of the lives lost on 9-11 right outside his gas station. Um, the Sikh Coalition was founded because there were a group of volunteers who just realized there was a missing component for our community where we could have a voice and be at the table, um, whether talking to members of Congress or talking to the administration at the time, right, to make sure that Sikhs were heard and that we were a part of the conversation because we were very much a part of um, what was happening uh, in those days, weeks, months after 9-11. One of the most important things that I think I wanna say here is we had an option to separate ourselves from the Muslim community, um, to say, we are not like them, this is, we're different and really use that as our um, pillar for our campaign. Um, but instead we said, none, none of us, right? N not, not on any of us. Um, and we really joined forces um, locked arms with our, our Muslim and Arab brothers and sisters, worked with the Jewish community, right? Other impacted communities and created coalitions and worked in coalition. And I think that's the impactful work we were able to do to get a seat at the table that the Sikh community just never had before. Um, and again, it's it's not just advocacy, right? Um, in order to, to do this effectively, we needed to do it with every pillar. And so that included creating a legal team, right? There was no legal representation, free nonprofit, social justice, legal representation available for the Sikh community before the Sikh coalition. The Sikh coalition started that. We got our first full-time attorney, right? Um, taking on hate incidents, whether we're talking about hate violence, bullying, employment discrimination. Um, we had a communication shop that we also had to create. How are we making sure Sikhs are included in the media narrative? Right, that our narrative is correct, um, that we're represented um, correctly as well. Um, and then advocacy, right, on the state and national level, local level, how are we making sure we are um, a part of the conversations around legislation that can help, one, track hate crimes um, accurately for the Sikh community, but also two, what other proactive measures can we be taking um, to ensure the safety of our community, such as what is now the, the Nonprofit Security Act, uh, Grant Act that allows um, Gudwaras, for example, to, to get security. Um, and then there's the uh, community development side, right? What does the community need? Making sure we're establishing those relationships as so many folks in, in previous panels have said that community aspect is, is critical, right? We can't uh, talk amongst ourselves without talking to the folks who are impacted every single day on the ground. So including their voices as well. Um, and so with these various aspects and teams, uh, we're able to kind of meld a program um, and, and design a blueprint that we're able to use because unfortunately the hate violence hasn't stopped, right? September 15th was the first one we saw at, at the aftermath of 9-11, but since then we've had so many, including Oak Creek and, and, and example after example. And, and just in the last few weeks in New York, we've seen several incidents coming out of the Queens area of New York. Um, and so we continue to use that model. Uh, but again, the most critical piece of all of that work has been partnership and community, because I think um, if we can't create that education on why um, ignorance breeds animosity and why um, education is such an incredibly important piece to addressing hate, um, then we're not going to be able to, to create some of that change. And so 
part of that effort is working with law enforcement and uh, training law enforcement and providing trainings for law enforcement to then utilize uh, amongst themselves as well about the sick faith, about how we do this work, about what the gaps are in, in for example, again, tracking hate crimes or um, in just the, the community relationship with law enforcement and how we can all do better. Um, so continuing to provide those resources and be partners, uh, both with the DOJ, right, law enforcement, uh, various agencies, uh, whether again, nationally and locally in the states, um, is critically important for us to be able to do the work that we do effectively and make sure we're going from community to advocacy to um, government and then back down to the community in a circle that, that really does make sure that their voices are heard. Thank you, Ms. Singh. Uh, really valuable insights uh, and, and backdrop. I wanna turn next to Ms. Aziz. Uh, Ms. Aziz, how has your organization, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, empowered community and survivor voices? Sure, thank you for the question. And thank you to Attorney General Garland and Assistant Attorney General Clark uh, for hosting this conversation and of course for all of the work DOJ continues to do to counter hate and hold perpetrators accountable. Um, when the Leadership Conference was founded in 1950, it was founded out of the belief that the fight for civil rights could not be won by one group alone, but needed to be waged in coalition. And that's very much how we approach our work to countering hate. We work in coalition across communities for the common purpose of creating an America where everyone can live free from hate. The Jewish community alone cannot defeat anti-Semitism, nor should they. The LGBTQ plus community alone cannot defeat homophobia and transphobia, nor should they. The Arab American community alone cannot defeat anti-Arab bigotry, nor should they. There is strength in coalition and there is strength in solidarity. And that is why I'm very proud to staff the National Hate Crimes Task Force at the Leadership Conference. Um, you know, yes, we do policy advocacy. We work to improve hate crime data, enhance the response to hate crimes, but we're also very much grounded in the lived experiences of the different communities represented in our coalition. Um, the task force has long centered survivors and directly impacted communities. And not only do we try to make sure that all of our work is survivor informed, um, but we try to amplify these stories as much as we can. The more people hear stories of survivors and directly impacted communities, the less hate there will be. It's hard to disregard someone's humanity when you hear these stories. Um, when you hear Officer Bird Grant's story, when you hear about Dennis and Judy Shepard, when you hear Pardeep speak and you hear about Rabbi Meyer's experiences, when you hear about the family of Wadia Al-Fayumi and what they went through, um, it really forces a question of what kind of country do we want to be? And to create an America where we can all live free from hate, we must center our common humanity over hate. So we work to create that space for survivor stories, stories to be shared and amplified, um, and we do our best to support them. You know, survivors and directly impacted communities are at the heart of this work. Their voices have power, and we can't forget that. Thank you, Ms. Aziz. Uh, and now a, a final question for all the panelists, and, and Ms. Aziz, I'd actually like to uh, stay with you on this. Uh, the subtitle for today's event is Connecting Community Voices and Strengthening Law Enforcement Partnerships. Recent FBI statistics and the world events that several folks have, uh, have mentioned make clear that we're living in a heightened hate crimes environment. What do you think we can do as government, advocates, citizens, and neighbors in concrete terms to unite against hate? Many of you have mentioned many things. Um, Ms. Aziz? Sure, well, very briefly, I'll mention two things. The first thing we can all do, government, neighbors, citizens, everyone, is speak out against hate and denounce it by name. That's incredibly helpful and impactful and meaningful to the communities that are targeted. Um, the second thing that we can do, the Leadership Conference is a coalition of over 240 national organizations, uh, many of whom have regional and local affiliates across the country. Um, they're doing very impactful work in this space and you know, uniting these efforts um, with United Against Hate Community Outreach Program, the United Against Hate Community Outreach Program um, would be a great tool to amplify the work and leverage uh, the great work that one another are doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, really valuable 
uh, insights and suggestions. Um, Rabbi Myers, I'm going to come back to you. Any reaction to these observations and what are your thoughts on next steps? So many wonderful organizations and institutions out there doing incredible work. My concern is, is duplication of effort, um, sometimes stepping on each other's toes is a possibility because one has to also um, be in the public eye to gain continued um, interest in your efforts. And I'd like to see how can we better um, leverage all of these wonderful organizations, um, not under the umbrella of one organization, but somehow there's a better way to find collaboration uh, because I've seen so many uh, efforts to do comparable things by different organizations. And uh, I can only say as, uh, as a civilian, it could be mind numbing the number of possible meetings that I'm called to attend, um, which is again, duplication. Um, so to me, that's really the critical thing um, how can we find ways to all gather together um, and uh, have an incredible massive effort as opposed to so many medium-sized efforts? Um, that to me would be a really important thing to consider. And uh, uh, as I suggested to you in a conversation that uh, could be perhaps that uh, our uh, uh, US attorneys could uh, provide um, leadership you know, in a couple of communities to see how can we pull together all the resources in some sort of consortium to identify what are the strengths of each organization and how can we each put a best foot forward collectively. Thank you. Uh, these are really innovative suggestions. Great to hear. And I'm gonna turn now to US Attorney Olsham. Um, what do you have to say in reaction um, to what you've heard so far and perhaps in particular to uh, the suggestion just made? I, I think um, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight. Uh, I think at least from the federal standpoint, we have to do um, a better job um, making sure that the people who are affected in um, the community um, know who to call. Um, and I think Rabbi Meyer's point is a good one. We have to figure out a way to be clear in our in our messaging, and um, the federal government has a role to play in that. I think one way that we can assist is sort of in our convening ability at the federal level. A lot of the reporting that happens happens at the state and local level, and so we can bring state and local partners together to make sure that um, uh, the appropriate um, lines of communication are made clear to the community, because not every community is a monolith. Not every victimized community has the same relationship with law enforcement. Um, even within communities, there can be divisions amongst um, um, people in, you know, uh, in those communities. And so I think um, uh, making sure that we bring the appropriate people to the table using our ability at the federal level um, as U.S. attorneys and at the Justice Department um, is critical. And the last thing I'll say is that um, I think it is a good thing that there are a lot of community resources. You know, one of the things that was very beneficial in um, Pittsburgh was just the ability um, or for victims and the communities to have um, resources available to them that maybe we could not provide um, through our role as uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office as prosecutors, but making sure that people um, are aware of those um, immense um, resources is, is also very important. Thank you. Some really important points um, there as well. Um, Ms. Singh, uh, what thoughts do you have about next steps? What do you think you. we should do as government advocates, citizens, neighbors in concrete terms to unite against hate? Thank you. Um, well, as several others have noted today, engagement opportunities grow trust, especially if they occur consistently. But trust is also built when law enforcement reports hate crimes to the FBI. And according to the most recent FBI hate crime statistics published last month for 2022, six still remain the second most targeted group in the nation for religiously motivated hate crime incidents. Um, we are concerned that this is not an accurate count due to the law enforcement underreporting and inconsistent bias classifications by law enforcement agencies. Reporting has been a huge issue for our community and I'm sure other, other communities as well. Um, and law enforcement is more likely to report when they have relationships with targeted communities and understand them better. 
But community trust also necessitates faith in our law enforcement agencies to respond to hate crimes and track hate crimes. Uh, I'll say the Sikh Coalition recently celebrated the passage of AB 449 in California, which will require every law enforcement agency across the state to adopt a hate crime policy with detailed specific protocols, instructing officers on how to identify, respond to, and report hate crimes. That is something that is critical across the country to make sure that we don't have these holes in reporting so that organizations like us can do our job effectively, um, especially in the advocacy space. And I'll finally, I'll say it's not only important to show up during an, a crisis and, and appear in times of crisis, it's also required um, afterwards, right, that long term support that can stretch into decades, just building that foundation with communities, um, making sure they feel heard and making sure there is that continued communication uh, to effectively think through policies, programs, resources that we can be providing them. So encouraging everyone who's listening in to think about those long-term relationships that we can be building. Thank you so much. Uh, what you said echoes what the shepherd said, um, know us before you need us, uh, exactly. And uh, thanks for flagging that legislation uh, and the law enforcement hate crimes reporting deficit. We, we've known and been working on that issue for a long time. Uh, Mr. Kaleka, I'd like to conclude our panel by turning to you. You've done such a, a beautiful job in sort of providing the frame. Um, I, I'm hoping you can leave us with some, some final insights uh, as we conclude our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Sheila. Just, uh, uh, you know, when I think back to the past 12 years uh, that I've been in this work, I, I think back about, and we started the program talking about some very sobering numbers. And I think that the work that we do is really, and the sobering numbers need to be attached to just, just the sobering stories of the impact, of the deep impact that communal trauma can have. Mm -hmm. Um, there's obviously no shortage of six in America and outside of America that were impacted by what happened. Um, and I think for all of us, it calls on us to say, you know, what is a, a deeper part of ourselves and what do we stand for? Um, this, this is about trust building. This is about working across sectors, multi-sector sort of uh, collaborations. But this is also about uh, understanding the importance of relationships, genuine relationships. And that means that we have to take on some of those tough conversations. Um, and there are some very, very tough conversations to take on that are impacting our local communities. Um, and uh, we need to address those. And then, you know, I'm, you know, you know, you know me personally as well. And you know that I'm, uh, I'm always up for uh, difficult conversations. I'm always up for like, what, what is it? And centering the community and making sure that there's, you know, hate uh, does not have a home in any community. Um, as we kind of go forward, um, I think just, just making sure that, you know, you call up on some of those people that can say, hey, you know what? It's, and I feel like many of the people that are on the call, on the, uh, speaking right now, have always been a bridge. I mean, we've always have had to be, be the bridge between either our parents, our community, and the community abroad. Um, my father, uh, just to share, like just last story with you. Um, you know, it's and it's well known that he um, had a butter knife that he was fighting with a gunman, um, a gunman who said that people like him don't belong in this country. And what I've been told over the years was uh don't you wish that your father had a gun don't you wish that your father could have killed him don't you wish that your father like all of these things but the fact was that my, my dad had a knife and this gunman obviously had a firearm and sometimes when we lose the fight it doesn't mean that we're going to lose the war and it calls upon all of us to say how can we muster the courage to go forward to make sure that him and other people who are impacted by hate, the you know the shepherds, the birds, all of the families that are impacted by hate, are not going to lose that war. So I just encourage you to keep fighting. Um, you know we do this work together. Times of good, bad, 
I remember to laugh, remember to, to, to cry together as well. So I think remember to come together in times of peace as well. Um, just take care of yourselves. And I think that, that that's the, that's the, that's the long-term work, right? And this moral arc will bend towards the good, but we have to have, we have to have the will to bend it. That was really powerful. Thank you so much, Hardeep. Everything said today supports centering survivor stories and uniting in common cause with ongoing hate crimes prevention efforts. So I, I, I just wanna thank you all so much, our panelists uh, for this panel. I'm just so grateful for your leadership and your partnership. And we're very excited to see what lies ahead given the inspiring work that all of you are doing. Thank you. We're gonna switch gears now um, to another presenter. Earlier this week, the Justice Department announced awards to support community-based organizations and civil rights groups to do exactly the kind of hate crimes prevention work discussed during both of today's panels, including coalition building with law enforcement. To tell us more about these awards and other Justice Department resources, I'm going to turn now to Deputy Associate Attorney General Saeed Modi, who serves as the department's anti-hate crimes resources coordinator. Saeed? Thank you, Sheila, and thank you to our panelists. Today's event could not have been more timely, and I echo that our coalitions are our strength. I would say that we're in particularly challenging times right now, but it seems like that is always the case. And today's event is a reminder that there are more of us working to combat hate than those working to promote it. And this should give us all hope. But hope must also spur action. As we've heard today, alliances to combat hate are being built in communities across the country. And I want to talk about how the Justice Department is supporting those efforts through our hate crime grants to state and local community-based organizations and law enforcement agencies. On Monday, Associate Attorney General Benita Gupta announced that the Justice Department's Office of Justice Programs is awarding over $38 million this year to support the investigation and prosecution of hate crimes, increase hate crimes reporting, expand victim services, and improve community awareness. This is more money than we awarded in the last two years combined. Through the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Program, we are awarding over $17 million this year to help state and local law enforcement improve the investigation and prosecution of hate crimes and support victims. This program was first funded in 2021, and since then, the Bureau of Justice Assistance has given 35 awards totaling over $26 million. The department also awarded more than $8 million this year to community-based organizations and civil rights groups to promote community awareness and preparedness, increase victim reporting, strengthen community resiliency, and improve responses to hate crimes. For example, the Charleston Jewish Federation in South Carolina is expanding anti-Semitism trainings for schools, workplaces, law enforcement agencies, and local governments. And the Equality California Institute is using funds to establish an advisory committee of community-based organizations who will work collectively to analyze data to assess and enhance the reporting of hate crimes. The department is also awarding over $2.3 million in research grants to improve prevention efforts and study how communities and government can work together to proactively reduce hate crimes. The Urban Institute is using a research grant to evaluate hate crimes task forces and will develop a toolkit of protocols for communities to consider when developing teams in response to hate crimes. And through the Jabara No Hate, Jabara Hire No Hate Act program, which was created by the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, we are funding a state-run hate crime hotline in Nevada and supporting law enforcement agencies transitioning from the old crime data collection system to the National Incident-Based Reporting System, NIBRS, to improve hate crime reporting. The department's community relations services also plays a vital role in the department's ability to respond to and prevent hate crimes. Because of the expanded authority given to CRS by the Shepherd Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act. CRS works with communities in conflict to help rebuild relationships and encourage the development of local solutions. CRS has been an important partner in many of the United Against Hate programs across the country. And this past year has facilitated over a dozen Protecting Places of Worship forums to provide interfaith communities with resources and information on securing their places of worship and to help faith leaders build relationships with law enforcement. 
The Attorney General's May 2021 memo on improving the department's efforts to combat hate crimes and hate incidents called for the revitalization of CRS because of its unique ability to mediate and resolve conflicts and its ability to deepen the department's engagement with communities. The AG's memo also called for the establishment of a department-wide language access coordinator because language access is a key barrier to the reporting of hate crimes and hate incidents. The department's coordinator joined the Office for Access to Justice last year and now chairs the department's language access working group to help improve and expand on the department's language resources. In August, we released an updated department-wide language access plan to ensure that all individuals, regardless of language used, are able to fully use the Justice Department's programs, activities, and services. These are just a few examples of department-wide efforts to combat and prevent hate crimes. These partnerships and centering community voices are critical in times like these. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Associate Attorney General Modi, for taking time today to share this critically important information about all the department's efforts to, and resources to combat unlawful acts of hate. Our final panel for today, today's virtual forum is a roundtable discussion with a distinguished group of community leaders. Assistant Attorney General Clark will introduce the members of the roundtable and moderate the discussion. Because this roundtable is nearing the end of today's forum, I'd like to take this time to thank everyone in our audience for lending us your valuable time to hear and learn from this important conversation. And please remember that our program guide shared with you earlier contains links to the resources and documents referenced today. We'll also share a follow-up email with similar information with all of the attendees. And with that, I will say goodbye and pass the virtual floor back to Assistant Attorney General Clark. Thank you uh, so much, Lewis, for all of your help uh, emceeing today's important program. We're now privileged to be joined by leaders of some of the nation's leading civil rights organizations for a roundtable discussion on how we can all work together in the fight against hate. Uh, we are joined today by Sheila Katz. She is the CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women, a 130-year-old Jewish feminist civil rights organization with over 210,000 advocates working for the full equity and safety of women, children, and families here in the United States and in Israel. Also with us is Damon Hewitt, president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization formed in 1963 at the request of President Kennedy to enlist the private bar's leadership and resources in combating racial discrimination. And Maya Berry, Executive Director of the Arab American Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan civil rights advocacy organization founded to nurture and encourage direct participation in our political and civic life to mobilize a strong, educated, and empowered Arab American community. Thanks so much to all of you for being here today. Uh, Damon, I wanna start first uh, with you. Um, even though the recent FBI statistics show an increase in hate crimes, we know that the numbers don't tell the full picture and don't fully reveal the extent of hate crimes that we face in the country underreporting of hate crimes remains a serious problem, and I know that it's an issue that you have taken up. What is the Lawyers Committee doing to increase hate crimes reporting? Well, first, uh, I'd love just love to thank you, Associate Attorney General Clark, for your leadership, uh, both now at DOJ and also uh, when you worked in civil society uh, uh, and civil rights. Uh, you've been a visionary and an amazing partner to so many people and so many organizations uh, on this work. Uh, to respond to your question first, I have to say that there, there are various reasons why hate crimes are underreported. One is about that lack of authentic connection and trust with law enforcement. Also, there's some challenges with local law enforcement uh, actually reporting up to the FBI. But there's another issue, which is that instinctively, we as humans, as people, we 
when we experience wrong, especially when it's a racialized or ethnic or faith related wrong, we instinctively know what's wrong. We don't always know the bright line between what's considered a crime and what's not under uh, state and federal law. So that's certainly an impediment. For those reasons, we do think that the connection between community and law enforcement is a bilateral one, but we have focused over, the, over a number of years on law enforcement, on training law enforcement officers, uh, local and state uh, primarily, uh, and even sometimes campus police, on how to be responsive uh, to hate crimes, not just how to see people as fully human, but how to address the harms as if you were standing in their shoes. We work with law enforcement on how to treat people with respect, uh, to support them when they've encountered uh, such a horrible experience. And we think that doing this will over time help increase community trust. I like to thank our partners at the Matthew Shepard Foundation, and also more recently partners in, in recent years at Meta or Facebook uh, for their support and, and partnership in conducting these trainings. We've also uh, pursued other tracks. We think that uh, it's important to lift up the stories and experiences of people who are survivors when they are willing to do so. And so as you know well, Associate Attorney General Clark, we've worked uh, closely at the Lawyers Committee with families of those who have been impacted, the family of James Byrd Jr., uh, the family of uh, descendants of Emmett Till, the family of Second Lieutenant Richard W. Collins III, uh, who was a ROTC officer who was murdered by a white supremacist on the campus of the University of Maryland College Park. It's so important uh, that our relationships with, with these families, uh, with Susan Bro, mother of Heather Heyer, and so many others, that whenever we lift up their stories, we do so with their permission. We do so as much as possible alongside them. We do so in a way that is reparative and regenerative for them. And then finally, because we are lawyers, we also think it's important to use the legal system uh, to address these challenges. So whether it be the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the Patriot Front, all of whom we sued multiple times, we do think that not only this, this, uh, disabling these organizations in courts uh, through litigation, but also discrediting their tactics, their beliefs is also very important. All of this work as some total gives community members, victim survivors, and their family members and loved ones a sense that someone is fighting for them, that there is a place you can turn, uh, whether it be law enforcement, whether it be us or other, other of our partner organizations, that your experiences matter and you are valuable. Yeah, I, I um, want to thank you and uh, your colleagues at the Lawyers Committee for centering the voices of victims and survivors and impacted people. It is so uh, critical in the course of doing this work. Uh, and thank you for the work that you're doing to push for the importance of having full and complete data without that picture uh, and, and full data it's difficult to understand where the problems lie. So uh, it's critical that we do everything that we can to push for more reporting of data by law enforcement and to encourage victims and communities to report incidents uh, when and where they occur. Um, Ms. Katz, I would love to turn to you now in recent months. We've seen a troubling uptick in anti-Semitic hate crimes and hate incidents and um, events around the world over the last few weeks are likely to lead to an increase in anti-Semitic incidents here in the US. This state of affairs, unfortunately, is not unfamiliar to many in the Jewish community. And I wondered if you could talk about the work that your organization is doing to respond to uh, the increase in domestic hate crimes and ways in which you all have and are hoping to partner with the Justice Department in doing this work. Yeah, well, thanks again for having me and for being such a great partner, Assistant Attorney General Clark and Damon and Maya, who I also consider my partners in justice. Uh, listen, it is a scary time to be Jewish in America, full stop. And it, we know anti-Semitism was already surging on October 6th. And since October 7th, um, during the massacre in Israel and following war, it's taken far too many lives. Um, we know that hate crimes towards Jews have increased by close to 400%. 
And as the FBI director, Christopher Ray just warned at the Senate panel yesterday, anti-Semitism in the US is reaching historic levels and that Jews make up about 2.4% of the US public, but we actually account for 60% of all religious-based hate crimes. And so I can't go anywhere without first expressing my gratitude to you and the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security for your vigilance and combating hate and for all you are doing to work to keep us safe in these troubling times. And obviously we have to be able to say anti-Semitism is a problem full stop, but we know that hate impacts so many com communities. I know we're gonna talk about anti-Arab and anti-Muslim hate that's also happening, which is important because we have to fight this hate together. And, um, and what I could say before October 7th that we are navigating as the oldest Jewish um, feminist organization in this country that also works deeply on issues of reproductive rights is, um, you know, we worked with you very closely on the FACE Act outside of abortion clinics. You know, it's important to us that everyone have access to their own bodily autonomy. And you, when you look at like the Venn diagram of people who are white Christian nationalists who want to harm a variety of people um, and anti-abortion activists who are choosing violence, it's, it's actually one circle. And so we've been actually spending a lot of our time in the last several years working on navigating white Christian nationalism um, as, as an umbrella of a variety of hate that we're seeing from multiple groups. And our work is about partnering with other marginalized religious groups, with other marginalized communities, and working in government to pass hate crimes prevention legislation, like the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and more, and even the Violence Against Women Act, which we worked on this past year. Um, and we couldn't be more grateful during um, what feels like awful times to even hold everything that's happening right now for the ongoing partnership and collaboration. And, um, and Assistant Attorney General Clark, one of the things I value most in working with you and your department, um, like Damon was saying about listening to the families, is you convene people who are most impacted and you listen to what the needs are on the ground. And that's how we found so many solutions. And I also think we've come together in times where we're not being reactive and we're being proactive. And so we couldn't be more grateful for the whole of government approach in combating anti-Semitism um, that you are essential in putting forward. And we all know there's so much more work to do, but we're gonna do it by remaining in community, by combating hate everywhere that it is, by calling it out and actually creating legislative solutions um, to make things better for everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you for that and um, for underscoring how um, important it is for us to remain vigilant at this moment. Um, Ms. Bar Barry, I want to turn next to you because recent events have also led to a surge of acts of hate directed towards Muslim and Arab communities and communities and people who are perceived to be Muslim or Arab. And the tragic killing of six-year-old uh, Wadia Al-Fayume and the severe wounding of his mother is a painful reminder of the impacts of these unlawful acts of hate and the ways in which they can traumatize entire communities. So, um, you know, I, I know that some people have kind of compared this moment to the moment following 9-11, uh, a moment where we saw a backlash felt by many Muslim, Arab, Sikh, and South Asian communities across the country who were targeted after uh, the 9-11 tragedy. I'm wondering if you could speak to those concerns and talk about how the Justice Department can work with organizations like yours to provide assistance in this moment. Well, first, I want to echo the gratitude um, to you, Assistant Attorney General Clark, and, and all of my colleagues um, that are part of this convening today, because it is in this work that we come together to, to do better, um, and we all must do better. So thank you uh, for that. Y you know, the 9-11 comparison um, was difficult to hear immediately after this, and um, I have to say my sort of immediate response was, no, let's, you know, let's be careful. I have a month into it, um, in some ways, I regretfully would say it's worse. Um, and partly because I think um, um, 
the response um, and, and the places that it's coming at us from is um, so incredibly different um, and, and really, really problematic. Um, we, uh, I, I was delighted to wake up this morning to hear um, that um, um, the 21-year-old uh, um, at Cornell University was, was charged for threatening um, Jewish students on, on that campus. And before I could take comfort in at least that would stop at Cornell, I saw an article about um, um, a university here at American University, um, a Palestinian American IT professional who had a note slipped under his office that said, um, you might get lucky with a mis missile death to all Palestinians. Um, in my hometown of, of Dearborn, Michigan, which I can never do any of these sessions without mentioning because it's so incredibly important to me. Um, when we trend on Twitter, I, I'm, I'm worried. Um, and we had um, um, a gentleman, a 41-year-old man who um, was charged uh, with threatening um, uh, specifically our community there asking, uh, you might, I'm sorry, saying if anyone wanted to, posting on social media, if anyone wanted to go Dearborn, to Dearborn and hunt Palestinians. Um, so the 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 threats are, are real um, and and very alarming, um, particularly in terms of what's happening on on college campuses uh, for our kids right now. It's 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 really been detrimental. I want to share with you something because I think it helps. Uh, we we put a poll into the field uh, during this and and we got those results back and shared them yesterday. Uh, Seventy eight percent of Arab Americans are concerned about an increase in anti Arab bigotry. And 67% of them are, are concerned about an increase in anti-Semitism. They do see this as one that's targeting both communities and one that requires a response from, from all of us. And, and a very careful way in which we talk about um, the data and, and what is happening uh, in our communities. Um, related, 59% of my community said they face discrimination. And within that, 74% of kids 18 to 24 year olds and within that, 70% of Arab Americans who are also Muslim. So it, it, the threat, <laughs> um, I'd leave you with the final thing from the poll. 45% of Arab Americans right now said they were worried about their personal safety. This entire conversation we're having is grounded in, in that, frankly, and that is that we must be able to allow communities to live in safety. Um, I... I think one of the most important partnerships um, uh, with this Department of Justice has been the prioritization of, of combating hate and bias. Um, what we're doing today, what we've done for a long time, um, what we've done since the passage of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and Jamar Hire No Hate, um, it, it, it has meant a great deal. Um, and I think it's helped protect people, uh, to be clear. Um, you know, we've talked about the FBI data uh, and we've talked about the massive need to get to a place where it's accurate. Um, and I would suggest that requires mandatory hate crime reporting and, and really uh, finally tying that to to um, to the issue of, of actual funds, not just accreditation, but to go further. Um, but we it, every year <laughs> since 2016, we break a new record. Every year we talk about this data increase and increase with each category, it's a record breaking year. This is not something that, that any of us um, want to see. Um, and and um, the response from, from the department um, during times like this has been critical. We've talked about um, the devastating murder of, of six-year-old Woody in, in Illinois. Um, we learned of that incident on, on Sunday. Uh, by Sunday night, a very powerful and impactful statement was issued from Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland. That's the kind of responsiveness that helps us when we work with our communities to understand that there is a, a Department of Justice that cares deeply about these issues. Um, so are there things that we can be doing better? Um, I'm going to just, if you don't mind, quickly highlight a few things. Um, the colleague who spoke about um, trust cannot be assumed. As a community that has been um, regretfully sort of positioned at the intersection of civil rights and civil liberties in a, in a very meaningful way, as a community who has um, a challenging relationship sometimes with law enforcement because we have been securitized um, in terms of how we are perceived, it's really, really important um, to understand that that is correct. Uh, for us, one of the 
major issues for underreporting is trust with local law enforcement, trust with law enforcement in general, and the barriers that are there. So the more that we can work um, to, to get past that, the, the better. Uh, community relations service plays in a really critical role. CRS has um, been um, and needs to be more um, utilized. <laughs> um, so for, for when I put out an email last week to my membership saying, this is what's happening. These are the things you can do. I shared CRS as a resource for people to feel comfortable with because it's incredibly important that they do so. Uh, and then I do want to mention one point um, um, in terms of the outreach. Uh, I would say respectfully, we ask um, our government officials and, and colleagues not to conflate religion with ethnicity. Um, mm. And this is critical to get the outreach part right. Um, it is absolutely important that we talk about Muslim Jewish outreach and the importance of doing that. Uh, but please know that when we do frame that uh, and you're doing your outreach, outreach through the U.S. attorney's offices or local offices across excuse me, across the country, that doesn't encompass outreach to the Arab American community. Um, and and it's while we have some overlap, it's just important to, to acknowledge um, that piece of it and, and to get it right. And then finally, I would say, is the Justice Department prioritizing policies and practices that actually elevate the prosecution of hate crimes? That has been uh, an issue uh, historically. And I think one of the most heartening things um, of this particular Justice Department is how much that has changed and, and how meaningful um, that has been. So I think the more we can continue to show that hate crime uh, prosecutions are a priority of this, just, this Justice Department, are a priority for the FBI, the more that we can do as community-based organizations to allow our communities to feel comfortable reporting hate crimes and engaging in a process of making our society safer for everyone. Um, th thank you for that. And in particular, thank you for the very constructive feedback on how we can ensure that our outreach efforts are effective, effective in reaching the communities that, um, that we need to touch through this work. So thank you for that. Um, one issue that we did not spend significant amount of time talking about during our program today is the increase that we are seeing in um, threats of violence taking place on online platforms. And Mr. Hewitt, I want to come to you for this one and ask you to maybe say a word about what you and your organization is doing in terms of addressing online harassment and ab abuse, and um, what steps have you taken to respond? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, I think I gave you a promotion to Associate Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General Clark uh, earlier, uh, so apologies uh, for that. Uh, uh, but at any rate, so since we've seen a change in leadership at Twitter, now known as X, We've seen a higher volume of a dramatic increase really in racist, white supremacist content. And I have to say, when I say white supremacist content is really essentially a cousin or a twin of the neo-Nazi content. Uh, so many of the groups I mentioned before, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, others, they hate black folks, they hate brown folks, they hate Jewish folks, pretty much all the same. You, you kind of flip a coin to see who's the, the target of the day with, with some of these groups. But what I would say is that in terms of all these online platforms, uh, the hate that is espoused through them, we have uh, pursued a parallel track. One is with the platforms themselves. Of course, I mentioned we have the civil litigation against uh, the individuals and the organizations, but also we pursue avenues of uh, regulation against the platforms themselves. Uh, some of these platforms really function as information superhighways for this type of neo-Nazi, white supremacist, racist content. And so to this point, many of the platforms say that they're trying to make inroads. And I think some people inside are, but they also cloak themselves uh, in, in liability, right? And so the courts resolve that it's gonna be very difficult to have much more effective litigation, but there will be more litigation. We also appeal to the higher angels among them uh, to really pursue uh, more significant self-regulation. And this is really a volume issue uh, with respect to a platform like YouTube, for example, uh, they tell us they do a great job with getting pornography uh, because their uh, individual people, their staff, and their algorithms can identify the images. But they have a much harder time if someone uses thinly veiled racist language towards Black people, towards Jewish people, towards others, unless they're actual racial epithets. 
And so they're almost telling us that they're so big that they have a problem, that they operate in so many countries and so many languages that there's a challenge. And so we are saying that this is not about your business model. We are your business model. This is a, these, these are people businesses. And so to the extent that these exchanges are monetized or that the company is making money, draw a bright line. Uh, to the extent that it is actual users, the actual people uh, who are your consumer base and essentially your product, to the extent we're being harmed, that is actually undermining your business. And so we make these appeals to the companies, but we also continue to pursue not only litigation, but regulation as well. Um, this next question, I want to direct to both uh, Ms. Katz and Ms. Berry. Um, Ms. Katz, you talked a little bit about some of the, the intersectionalities that you see in the course of doing this work. And um, I think that that's an important point, that when we look at hate crimes and hate incidents, we seize on the fact that uh, someone may not have been targeted simply because of their race or solely because of their religion. Uh, I referenced uh, one matter uh, that we recently worked on involving the obstruction of justice carried out during an investigation into the murder of a Black transgender woman, just by way of example. I wonder if you both might talk a little bit about some of the intersectionalities that we see in the hate space and um, what are some of the lessons and takeaways from that? I guess I'll go first. I was, um, I was gonna see if you wanted to jump in. Uh, I mean, you just said it, um, we're all connected. And I think that's something that we need to hold on to um, that, that hate that impacts one of us impacts all of us, that the people who hate tend to hate lots of different types of people as Damon was just talking about. And that's why we have to stay vigilant and call this out as we see it every single time, no excuses. And I'd just like to remind myself that there are more of us who want to build a world with love than there are of those who hate. And, um, and I think what's been scary in the last few years, decades, is that what was hidden, what was once a, a way in which people had to wear masks to demonstrate hate, it is now in the open. And it's not that it hasn't been there. It's just that people are emboldened and they're empowered to be able to hate publicly. And we don't want that. We don't want it at all, but we don't want people to feel like they can do it front and center while showing their faces. We want to have more people calling this out every single minute and every single day to build the world we're looking for. I think this is absolutely connected in every way it can be. And, and it also shows us that, that bad side, the good side is this is what connects us in our humanity and as people. And, um, and I, I'm proud to be fighting for a better world, not just for Jews, that's not our goal. Our, our goal is to build a better world for everyone. I, I agree uh, completely. And, and I think um, taking it back to 9-11, what my colleague from the Sikh Coalition reminded us of uh, in terms of who the first victims were after 9-11, um, it hate literally is intersectional. <laughs> and therefore, our response uh, certainly must be. Um, honestly, I when, when you were asking that, I was thinking about something that um, Rabbi Meyer said, which is that the obligation we all have to each other. Um, and, and I think, I think if we approach everything that we do and with rooted in that and an understanding of that, then we will think about both hate crimes, but also about potentially hate speech and the way that we talk about each other, making sure that uh, disagreements don't lead to the dehumanization of people, making sure that we are respectful of potential disagreements. I mean, that's something I'm particularly sitting with right now, um, given what's happening. I, I think we have an obligation um, to be careful and to protect each other. Um, and, and I think um, how we do that um, is certainly important. Um, and it's also important in terms of making sure that we all come together to respond to this, the scourge of hate that our country has been experiencing for many years now. Yeah. Um, 
we have been doing some hard work here over uh, the past two and a half hours during this program. And as we come to a, a close, it is not lost on me that it's still important that people stay positive and stay focused and that we all collectively find ways to work together towards a country where we all feel accepted and safe, uh, no matter uh, you know, who, who we are, or who we love, or what we believe, or where we come from, or what we look like. And so as, as we wrap up this discussion, I wondered if you could just say a brief word about how you uh, remain positive and focused in the course of doing this very hard work. And um, if you'd like, share words of encouragement for our participants um, as, as they prepare to go off. I will start. Um, once again, thanks for this opportunity, not just this closing session, but what you've been doing throughout the last few hours. It, it's, it's so critical and important. I would say, you know, it sounds cliche, but I do believe that our clients and community partners give us strength. At the Lawyers Committee, as you know, we have a practice of honoring uh, clients, uh, not just telling their stories, but actually bestowing awards upon them. Sometimes they don't want it. Uh, sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they're media shy for obvious reasons of fear of retribution. Sometimes we have clients who are those and whose names and identities aren't revealed, but it's really their lived experience and, and their fortitude, their grace, and frankly, their hope that gives us hope, um, that gives us reason to fight. You cannot do this work and be depressed all the time because we are, you know, people think we're foolish enough or wild enough or bold enough to think we can make a change together. And so it's an inherently optimistic enterprise that we're involved in fighting against hate. It's not all depressive. We're optimistic because we envision a world. And I think that vision is through the lens and the eyes of our clients and community partners. to say amen uh, i'll i'll jump in and build off of that damon and actually say that um in, in maya's last answer she was naming something that actually the talmud actually says similar to exactly what you were saying maya you know the talmud teaches kol yisrael aravim zebazeh that we are all responsible for one another. And Jewish tradition emphasizes the importance of honoring everybody's dignity and caring for our communal and social well being. And that's what I heard on this call today. Um, and as a Jew, I could say that our past and present experiences as Jewish people, as Jews, underscore our obligation to work towards ending all oppression and solidarity with others. And, and that's really what gives me hope um, that that we can do this together and we can be in this together. And when it's sad and awful, as Maya and I were talking about just the other day when we were together, we can sit in that sadness together and then fight it together too. I think we've really seen the worst of humanity recently, like the worst of humanity. And the way we fight that is by being the best of humanity together. And I have hope from all of you, from this administration, from the Department of Justice, and, um, and I really believe we're going to get there. I, I, um, it really is a difficult time to, to, uh, to talk about what we're talking about. And I so deeply appreciate the question, um, because at the end of the day, that is what we have to come back to because we all care deeply and want to be effective. So I, uh, I, I, my hope is, is really rooted in, um, in, in our young people. Um, I am um, every day um, highly motivated to make sure that I'm working harder, that we are doing better, uh, specifically for um, uh, protecting our, our young people and mobilizing um, on their behalf. Uh, this, I mean, I mentioned it already, the situation that we're seeing um, our kids are experiencing on college campuses right now is, is devastating and, and hurtful. And um, so I, I think, uh, um, and, and I, you know, it's been difficult not to um, look at all of the images, um, those um, that came immediately after October 7th and those um, um, from, from Israel and um, the subsequent images from, from Gaza. Um, uh, and I, there was a, just a, a moment of a, a young child, six months old in a chair, just laughing, just giggling because of a journalist leaning over and tickling this child. 
Um, and I thought, you know, that's that's what we're actually that really is how you're how you're raising this. We all must find that humanity in us and appreciate that. And if if um, if a young child um, can do that there, I, I certainly think we can uh, pick up where we leave off today and fight that much, much, much harder tomorrow. But uh, it is um, it's easier to do, though, when we're doing it in this type of partnership. And I'm deeply grateful for you, Sheila and Damon, and certainly for you, Assistant uh, Attorney General Clark and everyone on this call. Yeah. Uh, well, I am equally grateful to all of you uh, for your work. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and thank you for being here to share your experiences and insights today. If I can just add something, Attorney. Yeah. I just wanted to add, um, not to sound redundant, but being a voice for the voiceless and uh, just continuing to do the work and allowing the victims to feel heard through their stories. That's uh, one of my life missions as a police officer, as a public servant, is to um, allow them to feel heard and to know that they are not along in this um, this line of work or uh, being a victim. And um, that is my, I try to stay encouraged through those words. And hopefully one day we can identify each other as one and not individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Birdbrand. I think that is a perfect note to conclude this panel uh, on. Thank you so much. Thanks to all four of you uh, for being here today. And thanks to all of our participants. Uh, on behalf of the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, uh, we thank everybody who participated today and spoke from the heart and everything that you did to make this program meaningful to our Attorney General Merrick Garland, to all of our U.S. Attorney panelists, uh, to Officer Jamie Bird Brandt and your family, uh, to the Shepherd family, to the community leaders who stand united against hate, and to everyone who joined during this virtual program, a sincere and heartfelt thank you. Many of you who joined us today have yourselves stood on the front lines of these issues, standing at the intersection of community and law enforcement to end hate in America. And your continued efforts have provided the Civil Rights Division, our U.S. Attorney's Offices, and the entire Justice Department with valued partners in this fight. And we know that the work continues beyond this moment. There is great urgency behind all of the issues that we took up today. As partners, we should continue to consider every tool that we have available to us to ensure that our communities, our schools, our workplaces, our houses of worship, our stores, our streets are all safe spaces, free from threats and hate-fueled violence. It's my hope that this event has been empowering and that it will fuel our collective efforts to rise above hate and allow all of us to unite against hate. Thank you again for joining us today. <laughs>